Hi, my name is Douglas Vogt again from the Die Hole Foundation. And this is uh, Series 10, Part 5, on the uh, uh, last part of the Exodus uh, story and probably the most important part. This video is also going to be put on uh, Series 4 on the Ice Age of Polyversal, Part 5, which was how to save yourself from this event. Um, this video is going to cover the greatest secret that is embedded in the Torah. There's no greater secret than this. No one has ever figured it out or noticed it, but you'll see what I mean in a, in a few minutes, how this whole thing gets put together. Uh, where did the Hebrews go after leaving Mount Sinai? Uh, I know the surface story says they roamed there for 40 years and they were at Bernay Kadesh for 38 years. That's not really true. Um, finally, the possible ways are, uh, that an advanced previous civilization used the technology that you're, I'm going to explain to you here to survive these polar reversals. Uh, this volume three covers the, uh, the Exodus and uh, the Ark and how the things worked and where they went. In case you hadn't seen part four, part three and four on that covered in this book. Everything in this video is mostly covered in chapter 10 of God's Day of Judgment, which I wrote 12 years ago. I haven't put any of this stuff in any of the books because uh, I had the room in this book <laughs> very plainly. And also, it, uh, it's not an easy subject to put all the pieces together. I did it in this book only. Probably said too much also. This is the code systems you have to know in order to wind up figuring out what Moses is really trying to tell you. Um, I explain in this book what the Hebrew alphabet is and what the Torah actually is, why this story is so disjointed out of, out of place and out of sequence, and why he was stuck with what he did and how he wrote it, because he had no choice. Uh, he had a string of symbols. He couldn't change any of them, couldn't add any. And he had to create the Hebrew language and spelling and stuff like that from scratch. So anyway, that's the importance of these two books. These are, this one's really necessary to understand. We're not dealing with late Bronze Age people technology. It's just that late Bronze Age people discovered it. This is a, um, a summary of what we already know or have, should have picked up from my videos. The first is, was part four, uh, that the operating system orchestrated this whole thing from Abraham all to Moses, about either 270 or 290 years. Everything from giving Abraham the curiosity to go deep in that cave and find this stuff, then buy the place, after he sold his sister slash wife twice. And, uh, the whole thing was orchestrated by the operating system, and you're going to understand why. It was all for, the only thing I come up with is the creation of the alphabet. Now, the reason why the alphabet is so important is you imagine trying to write a math journal or a science journal of physics using hieroglyphics or cuneiform. You couldn't do it. We wouldn't have evolved nearly as far as we have without uh, an alphabet a way of easily describing our speech and our words. Number two, I've already proven that the number 12,068 was embedded in the Torah repeatedly, both in the, in the measurements of everything, even the chapters and verses. There's no question that a late Bronze Age people couldn't have figured out that this is the exact number of years between polar reversals or geomagnetic reversals in the Nova. They couldn't have. It took us, our civilization, the scientists to build uh, uh, telescopes, both optical and radio telescopes, know about the speed of light, the red shift, the, the spectral line frequencies of the elements. They didn't have that. We did, but that's what it took. And then I had to get 12 astronomers to measure the distance of the right kind of open clusters and globular clusters that get to see those blank periods in space. They didn't have that. 
Third, the operating system had the Hebrews build a flame speaker or plasma speaker. They had no idea what they were building. He told them what to build, how to build it, what, what, he, what technology they took out of the cave to put on top of the box and to make the thing work. But they didn't know they were building a flame speaker. <clears throat> oh, I wanted to thank Freeman Vesheer, who had come up with the calculation. I said in, in part four, when I showed you my rendition of what I think the ark looked like, what made it work, that the distance between the cherubim, the, the two cherubim, the anode and the cathode, was about 18 to 20 inches long. He calculated for us, it was 18 inches long, the gap between the two cherubims. It would take 1.371 million volts to, to, to jump that gap. But <clears throat> remember the tilt-up building, the tabernacle, was 20 feet high and 30 feet wide. So, and the, uh, and the boards were covered with gold. And the loops that connected the, raw, uh, the, the poles that held the boards together were gold. Everything was gold. In other words, Gold is a very good conductor of electricity. They wanted this thing so if a spark hit the wall, it would go to ground. So the distance between where the, the arc was and the spark gap to the wall was about 15 feet. I calculated that using his calculation. Comes out about 14 million volts. And it's certainly enough amperage to kill Aaron's two older sons who in their late 50s or early 60s. So, that thing, that thing that looked like a chair, that blue crystalline thing, was the computer and it generated a tremendous amount of power. We just don't know how many amps. For Genesis, it even tells us the exact month, the day, and the year uh, in our calendar when the next reversal is going to happen. And I showed that in one of the earlier videos, I think it was series, series 7 and I think maybe the latter part of series six. And the Hebrews certainly didn't know it, and the reason, they wouldn't even know what the number added up to. But the 2046 was, I showed you, totaling from Abraham, from uh, Adam all the way to Abraham when he had their first sons, and it totaled 2046. Uh, the message was, wasn't for Moses, it was for us and our calendar and actually gives the exact month, the day, and the year. Now, if you don't believe it's really the time when the next reversal is going to be, it's also the exact time when the next Gleisberg cycle is going to be, and they had no idea about the Gleisberg cycle. Fifth, the last thing, of course, is the most important. Here they told you the number of years between reversals. Uh, they tell you the month, the day, and the year. Uh, they give you the technology of how to find the thing. Don't you think they would have also told you maybe the best way of surviving this thing? And the answer is yes, they did. Unfortunately, it's the most coded story in the Torah. Um, the next is most of the, the coding is in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was not written over 700 years the scribe who translated it was Schaffen, unknown by all the scholars. Schaffen was really the, the given name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the prophet's name, uh, his prophet's name. So this is the quote where it comes out to. 2 Kings 22.8, And Hilkiah, the high priest, said unto Schaffen, the scribe, by the way, Schaffen then was his grandson. He was the grandfather. I have found a book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan read it before the king. Um, book of the law is no question. It's, it's Deuteronomy. It's one of Moses' books. Now, the one who put it away and hid it in, in the temple was probably Solomon because he violated a lot of the things that Moses says in Deuteronomy what not to do, like 
um, too many maids of service, uh, too many horses, etc. And he violated all of that stuff. So it was a good reason to hide it. You know, let's, let's forget about this book totally. King was so upset he wound up freaking out and ripping his clothing and stuff like that. Anyway, I had figured out, it took me 11 months, and I figured out they, they had a three names. They had a given name when they were born. Uh, when they went to the priesthood, they, were, they adopted a priestly name. And then finally, if they were the oldest son, the father died, they became the high priest. They adopted a prophet's name. They did it so other more powerful nations around them, the Assyrians, later the Babylonians, the Egyptians wouldn't know about this stuff, what they had, invade them and take it away from them. That's the other reason I think they made a copy of this thing. Anyway, the way I had to figure it out is, this is the, the years. I knew they, they got married roughly at, at 20 years old, and they had a boy either, either that year or one or two years later. Because the only way he could have is a boy or girl, nothing in between. You know what I mean? And so that's how I figured out who was born and how old they were and who was related to who. This is how I had to do it. This is just an example. I'll cover this when I, when I finally do finish off Volume 4 on the prophets and the priests. You'll find the whole thing. Okay. Surface story says that they were in Kadesh Brene for 38 years, but it only gets like basically one sentence. It's actually a part of a, a verse. And it's almost like in passing, like they were there for, for 38 years and Miriam died there. Uh, it's in Deuteronomy 2.14. This is, this is Kadesh Brene, Israeli borders here, and I'm going to show it to you. This is Kadesh Brene. The Israeli border is off there. It's basically a, a bunch of springs, and these little black dots are palm trees and other trees that are growing for food and fruit and, and for income. Along here, that's Brene, Kadesh Brene. <clears throat> There's never been any evidence of thousands of people living there. So the story about them there for 38 years is not true at all. But, in all fairness to dear sweet Moses, he does this many times where it should, he should give a long explanation like, how come he only mentions his sons once and then twice? He is here, the congregation is there for 38 years and he mentions it only in half of a line? I mean, that's crazy. It's basically, he's, he's basically telling you, like a sore thumb, uh, I'm telling you this, but it's not really true. <clears throat> the question is, is where did where the Hebrews go? Is there any evidence of a large population in the Sinai at any time? <laughs> the answer is no. So this is pictures that we took. Uh, we found huge flint fields around and mostly south of Mount Sinai, our Mount Sinai, the real one. We found huge flint fields. All the dark area in here is a flint field. This is all worked flint fields. Now, it's not all from the Hebrews. Some of this is the Neolithic period. We don't know how far back, but seven, eight, ten thousand years. Uh, we know from the desert varnish uh, accumulating on the flint that it's at least three to four thousand years old. All these dark areas are flint, worked flint. People working flint. Here's a close-up of what the ground looked like. <laughs> You'll want to know this when it says they walked through the desert for 40 years. You'll see my point. You'll laugh your head off. That's what the ground looks like in these flint fields. When it's not a flint field, you've got, this is actually a wadi here, not the one by the hill. And it's mostly, well, there's the flint and there's rock, limestone chips, and it's tough walking, I'll tell you. Okay, uh, so where the, where the Hebrews go, and how did they survive this 40 years? What did they do? Well, Moses gives a total of actually eight clues I give in the book. I'm going to give you seven of them. The eighth is really what the clues that were in Ezekiel, which I told you was written by Baruch. 
And the clues are there. Uh, so I'm going to go through the ones that are in the, in the Torah. So bear with me. And remember, you, you, got a, you got a mystery here. It's really a science mystery. So those of you who are atheists, my friends were atheists and agnostics, uh, bear with it. You're looking at a puzzle. You're trying to put the pieces together and figure it out. First clue. The second lunar year on the, first, on the 15th day, 50th day, Moses and the entire congregation pulled up tent stakes and left Mount Sinai, and they went south for three days. Yes, I do know roughly where they went. Exodus 23, 20, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee by the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared for you. Uh, take heed of him, an angel, and hearken unto his voice, and be not rebellious against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. I don't know exactly what this really means, um, but one day I guess we'll find out. So the joke here, now repeated, he repeats the thing twice. Exodus 32, 34. Now go lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Okay, you have to understand that the, they stayed there for 30 days when they finally arrived. The humor here. Here Moses was walking around and knew the Sinai Desert better than the back of his rear end. He was there, he probably left Egypt when he was about 18 or 19 years old. Uh, before he got married, before 20 years old. So he was in the desert for over 60 years. He knew that desert better than anybody else. He didn't need anybody to tell him where to go to either go back to Midia, where he, his father-in-law was. Didn't need anybody. So why is the operating system telling him, I'm sending an angel. By the way, my idea of an angel could be Anybody, if you dress modern clothing and went back in time, 3,300 years, they think you're an angel because you don't look like them. Second clue. So that's the first really good clue. Second clue. The Hebrews left Mount Sinai on the 50th day of the second year. They traveled for three days in the wilderness. Apparent. The key word is parent. You take the word apart. Parent is spelled like this. Paid up two words. The first part of the word, pay, could be pronounced like this, means mouth or opening. The last part of the, uh, the word, resh nun, means rejoicing or song of joy. Together, joyful opening. I, cover, I said that once before. So that's a usual name that he gives the area they're going south, joyful opening. It's a nice clue. Third clue, Hebrews alive three days later, they camp and suddenly strange things started happening that cannot logically be explained in normal reality. I, I listed all of them in the book. I'm only going to go through one or two here. So you understand, not, they're not normal time and space stuff. A fire started the upper part of the camp. This is when they first arrived. This is the reference here. Moses called the place Tabra. <clears throat> the word is made up of two words. The words mean to uncover a room or chamber. The book goes into how I figured out. I'm trying to make this short so this doesn't run, run on for over an hour, this video. It means to uncover a room or a chamber. Now you know why an angel, in quotes, had to lead them someplace special. They went them into a Room or chamber is what Moses is saying. They went someplace. Okay. <clears throat> of the seven unusual occurrences there, after 250 tribal leaders were killed because they, they challenged Moses, a plague started and killed 14,700 people. <laughs> this happened while there's food still in their mouth. That doesn't happen in normal time and space. It takes time for you to get sick. That's the total number of days in 40 years plus 90 days. 
You got that? I'll tell you what it means. Gives you a number, 14,700, and it means the 40 years, the 90 days is the 60 days it took them to go from Goshen to the base of the hill of Mount Sinai, and the 30 days, they're there. That's 90. See how he encoded this thing? What you, have to, you have to think three-dimensionally to figure what, what this guy's doing. What happened to the people three days after that left, uh, uh, left Mount Sinai cannot be explained in normal reality. Uh, it's in the book, really strange stuff. Earth opens up, some of their leadership, all their leadership drop into the, into the ground. I mean, things like this do not happen. Birds drop dead, two feet deep, and they go pick them up to eat them. That's what, how they got sick. I mean, it's just, you realize uh, this does not happen in normal time and space. Fourth clue. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, ye that have murmured against me. This is in book Numbers. And your children shall be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and shall bear your strayings until your carcasses be consumed in the wilderness. Now, I took both carcasses and consumed apart. I'm not going to go through consume, but it basically means like wailing and, and lamenting. But carcass was interesting. There's the word for carcass. First part of the word is this, which means body, corpse, or dead body. Well, that kind of fits the word. Okay. That first, but the, the rest, the half of the word is not a word. yod hut mim is not a word. Oh, by the way, for those who criticize. I don't use any of the final letters uh, in the Hebrew because they did not exist until about the 6th to 7th century of our common era. They were created by the leadership, the Jewish leadership then, not, not the time of Moses. They didn't exist. So I'm not going to use them. So anyway, this is not a word, but you remember the, one of the code systems is adjacent letter swaps. You swap the mim for a lamid, and you get this word, which means to prevail or overcome. So carcasses, he's coded the word to mean to overcome death. Gee, that's kind of interesting. The whole congregation that left Egypt over the age of 20 were supposed to be dead by the end of the 40 years. By these verses, the book of Deuteronomy starts by saying it was written at the end of the 40 years in the desert of Sinai. The following verses makes no sense because it contradicts what we are led to believe in the following Moses was supposed to be speaking directly to the entire congregation. In fact, in some of the verses, it starts out that Moses is talking, and by the middle of the end, you realize it's God's talking to the congregation. It gets a little confusing. I've only summarized these things. In the book, it's written out. It, it's fully explained. Deuteronomy 1.30. He did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness thereon thou, thou hast seen how. Now, as he's talking to the adults, you'll see that a little later, before your eyes. But this is the end of the 40 years. They're all supposed to be dead. 433, did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard and lived, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before thine eyes? You'll see this picture, before thine eyes, before thine eyes, it's talking to them. The Lord spoke with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire, and the Lord swallowed showed signs and wonders before your eyes. This is all the references here, by the way, so you can go check it yourself. Uh, he will put none of the evil d diseases of Egypt which thou knows upon thee. The great trials which thine eyes saw and the signs and errors. I, I, I've chopped out a bunch of stuff to make this sh as short as possible. And I took hold of the two tablets and cast them out of my two hands before your eyes. 
thy God that has done for thee these great and uh, tremendous things in Egypt, which thine eyes have seen. So you see the pattern right off the bat. He's talking to the people that left Egypt that are all supposed to be dead at the end of the 40 years. Gee, how could that be? <clears throat> 11 to, this is, in case you're wondering about children and stuff like that, here it is. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children that have not known and that have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God. This greatness, his greatness, his mighty hand, <laughs> yeah, the rod, and his outstretched arm, again, Moses' arm held the rod. And his signs and his works uh, he did in the midst of Egypt unto the Pharaoh, blah, blah, blah. But your eyes have seen all the great work of the Lord, which he did. And Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto the Pharaoh, which thine eyes saw the signs and those great wonders. Ye are standing this day, all of you, this is key. All of you before the Lord your God, your heads, your tribes, your elders, your officers, and all the men of Israel. If that doesn't make it as plain as day that they did not die at the end of the 40 years, even Korah's rebellion, that supposedly 250 of them were swallowed into the ground, they were all there. They were the leadership of all the tribes. They're all alive. Fifth clue, which is hilarious. This is really funny. Uh, because I, I roamed around the desert uh, three or four times, so I know. Okay, Deuteronomy 4, 8. Thine, re thine remnant, or clothing, waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. <laughs> yeah, right, fat chance of that. 29, 4. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxed old upon you, and thy shoes is not waxed old upon thy foot. I'm going to show you what the ground looked like up close and friendly. That's a close-up. This is all worked flint. The white stuff is, is uh, limestone chips, which are pretty, pr very hard and, and sharp. This is all worked flint. It's all sharp. Here's another picture of this stuff. This is random. See, the dark stuff is the flint, and this stuff... The light stuff is the limestone. You think you're going to walk in that stuff for 40 years with the same pair of shoes? Reality check. That's my boot. Here's, this is an average of what the soil looked like. This is what you're walking on. This is the more unusual stuff. <laughs> you're going to walk on this for 40 years? Your shoes do not last more than tops three or four months walking on that stuff. That's our shoes. In fact, on the first expedition, I'd give my extra pair of boots to the Egyptian because his was literally falling apart. The soles were coming off. This is what you're walking on. So we know right off the bat, oh, and their clothing? The ultraviolet light on your sweat will dissolve your clothing probably within the six months, no more than a year. They had cotton or flax, not going to last, no way. So that statement that your clothing is, is not going to fall off your body and your shoes aren't going to be shredded is pure, total nonsense. But he's done that deliberately. It's a clue. You're supposed to, it's like Occam's razor. What set of conditions could possibly allow this to happen? Sixth clue, related to the angel who led Moses in the desert 40 years, Deuteronomy 29.1. And Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, the great trials which thine eyes saw. The sign, okay. But the Lord hath not given you a heart to know, knows the brains to understand it, the education, the eyes to see, the ears to hear unto this day. 
The secret things, that's important, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. We may do all the wonders of this. Okay. He's admitting right here that there's knowledge and technology that's so advanced these people, these primitive people, do not understand what's happened to them, what they saw, how it was created, anything like that. This is outright admission that I'm saying, what I'm telling you is right, but nobody before me ever figured this stuff out. Like I said many times, you can't figure this book out unless you come in through the science side of it. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Seventh quote, the last one. Uh, Deuteronomy 34, the chapter starts off by saying that all of the blessings and curses will have passed, implying that the end of days. This is the end of days stuff. Verse 3, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity. That was the creation of the state of Israel in 47. <clears throat> and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the peoples whither the, the Lord thy God has scattered thee. If any of thine that are dispersed be in the uppermost parts of heaven, from hence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from hence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. <clears throat> the Hebrew word for heaven is this. The word is also given in chapter 1, 8 in Genesis. But it appears like this. There's the English pronunciation, which means vault of heaven. That would be a direct translation of the die hold. What's a vault? A vault is a safe that you put things in to keep them safe. Then nothing happens to them, nobody takes them. So you have, basically the die hold is a computer and it contains the stuff that makes up the entire universe. So we now know, or he's saying, or the operating system told Moses, there's other parts to this memory, this die hold, that things could be put into. I'll give you an analogy. It's a perfect analogy. When you're in Windows and you have a picture you want to save, you highlight it, you hit Control C. The, all the bits of information that makes up that JPEG or TIFF goes into a block of RAM memory. Now, it just sits there. Nothing's happened to it. Time just stays the way it is. Same thing if you grab text, like I grab this text and I put it in Control C, it goes in the same block of memory. Keep that in mind, what's going on. So we have, that's an analogy of what he's saying here. There's more than one parts to this memory stack and processing unit that creates our reality. This is the real family tree of Jesus sweet Moses. His three sons, or his two sons and their offspring. The key to what happened is actually in Joshua. That wasn't his real name, but that was his given, the name, his nickname Moses called him. His real name was Hoshea or Oshia. That's how he sh they show up. This is like a nickname. I explained that in the previous video. Now, I'll explain this too. I made the assumption that Eliezer, the younger, was born about six years later. If he was three years or two years later, then he would instead be, instead of three years old, he'd be either six or five years old, something like that. So I have a very leeway of about three to four years. But this is a young kid. The secret of what happened, of what happened, is encoded in his name and him, his age. Exodus 24, 13. And Moses rose up, and Joshua, his cupbearer or servant, 
That is the real translation when you take the word apart that they're calling minister. It's not minister at all. It was a servant or a cupbearer. And Moses went up into the mountain of God. 32.17, And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he, Moses, said, It is not this, the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of sound, uh, cry for overcome, but the, the noise of them that sing do I hear. Now, a little bit this is out of sequence. I'll explain. First part here, the first day of the first month of the second year, they assembled the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. The ark was inside the, ta the tabernacle, and they started, they made the thing work. And it was a seven-day period. Moses was there. His great-grandson, that's who Joshua is, his great-grandson, is evidently there bringing him food and drink and stuff like that. And he evidently stayed there. The congregation left after seven days. They went back down to the camp. And that's when his dear sweet brother decided, hey, I'm going to make a golden calf because I feel like it. And I'll use the excuse all the people say, well, where's Moses? He's disappeared. Evidently, when he got down with the seven days, Moses evidently went into the cave. And that's when he retrieved the two tablets and brought it back. But he was there a long time. So he may have been gone for... Not, not just seven days, but another three, four days. But, but jo uh, Joshua, his great-grandson, is there to bring him food and stuff like that. He probably went to the camp, came back, brought him food. Anyway, keep that in mind. Okay, now I'll explain this. Every adult knows the difference between the sounds of war and people getting their guts killed, you know, or having a great time at a great party which my son certainly does know, knows, does know how to do. To him, a good party was when the cops came two times. Anyway, but a kid that had never heard people enjoy and stuff like that, the only time he ever heard that was the Battle of Amalek a year before. So he related to that noise in the camp, which wasn't all that far away, to the noise of war because that's the only experience he had. Moses being 81 years old then, he knew the difference. But there's another indication how subtle it is. Do you know this is a little kid? Next one. Now this one's out of sequence. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Like I said, he had a long running conversation and discussions with the operating system. And he would return unto the camp, but his cupbearer servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, that's what he called him, a young man, departed not out of the tent. That's the tent of meeting, not the tabernacle. Numbers eleven twenty seven. 27. See, Moses is giving you the clues. The guy's a young kid. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the minister, or cupbearer, of Moses from his youth up, answered and said, My Lord, Moses, shut them, shut them in. Let me explain why this makes also no sense of the surface story. We know that Joshua, the son of Nun, were Ephraimites. And... They would have been, if the surface story is right, they would have been enslaved in Egypt. Well, Moses didn't come back into Egypt until the year before. So how could he possibly know Joshua from his youth up? Unless, if, if Joshua was in fact an adult, which obviously he wasn't. But in, in truth, you, you now know, it's Moses' great-grandson, he did know him from birth. I'm still amazed the rabbis never figured it out. It just boggles my mind. By number 13, uh, Numbers 13.1, and God tells Moses to select men to spy out the land of Canaan. And the Lord thy God said to Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a, a man. Now he calls him a man. In whom is spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 
20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swore unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me, save except, save means except, Caleb and Joshua, son of Nun. Which means, when it says except, it means they're already over 20 years old. I don't like that. So, so he's a little kid. In the beginning of this exodus, at the end, he's an adult. These are the names of the men that shall take possession of the land for you. Eliezer, the priest, that was uh, Aaron's third son, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Man again. Okay, now we summarize what's true and what's not true. Why did, why did the congregation have to have an angel lead them someplace in special that was some kind of opening? Yes, Moses tells us this twice because they could never have known where this place was. Two, were the Hebrews wandering the Sinai desert for 40 years? No, their clothing and shoes didn't wear out. That's really obvious. They weren't there for 40 years. Did all the adults over 20 that left Egypt die in the end of the 40 years in the Sinai? No. Moses tells us he was talking to all of them at the end of the 40 years. Four, was there more advanced technology that caused some events that the people could not possibly understand what was happening? Yes, and Moses admits to it. Was Joshua a young, man, a young child at the beginning of the Exodus and an adult at the end? Yes, the clues Moses gives us tells us that. Okay, three days after leaving Mount Sinai, they arrive at a place, led them to a room where everything changed. Uh, like I said, there's seven things that I list in the book that don't, doesn't happen in normal time and space because they were not in normal time and space. They were in a buffer. What these highly advanced previous civilization did, they were so advanced that they knew the operating system that makes our reality up. They were able to figure out there is a way to wind up surviving this horrible event, this cataclysm by putting yourself into a buffer where time goes slower. Now, I'm going to explain with, with dear sweet Joshua. They were in there for 30 days, but outside, 40 years had passed, times the number of days in a year equals 14,007, 14,610 days, divided by the 30 days, have a ratio of 4087 to 1. So notice if you're in there for one day, 487 days passed in normal time and space. If you were in this buffer for 150 days, 200 years would have passed. That would be the worst part of this cataclysm, Nova, Ice Age, would have passed. The snow around you would have melted. The grass hopefully would start to have grown. <clears throat> that's what's happening here. That's why it's the most coded and most difficult thing, story to figure out in the Torah. So, why did the operating system do all this? You can see, I showed you in the beginning, he's told you everything. The number of years between a reversal, when it's going to happen next, tentatively. And it looks like also he's told you a possible easy way of surviving this thing. Now, the only problem is, is I have a vague idea of where they went. You'd have to find it, get the thing to work again, and build a structure that it would go into, because I think the current one is buried and, and not, not that available. That may be a way of surviving this thing. Or the hard way, you, you build a large, large pyramid and you 
lots of them and you save your technology, your people, and do the best you can. That's it. Um, uh, I know this is a strange story and it's to the border of science fiction for many of you, but you saw the clues that Moses gave. I've proven in this series 10, one, Moses was not fictional, Abraham was not fictional, Joseph definitely was not fictional, we have statues of him. Um, there was an exodus, uh, you saw all the altars, you saw what drama was going on here and what God did. The ark is not a drum like one alleged scholar said. The Ethiopians do not have it, they're just good liars, that's all. And that's what you're looking at. You're dealing with a study of late Bronze Age people come in contact with and use the technology of people that are tens of millions of years more advanced than us. It would not surprise me one bit if these are the people that started out on the planets like Uranium, uh, Uranus or Neptune and when they, their planet had the same orbit as the Earth, you know, this far away from the Sun and um, closer a little bit further away and as the planets went further and further away after every single nova, you know, the nova shell pushes the planet a little further away, they immigrated to the next planet in. Eventually it was Jupiter, then there was a planet between Jupiter and Mars and somebody blew the hell out of it. And then they went to Mars and when Mars went too far away, guess where they come? They came. Yeah, they came here. And this is a story of evolution. You are forced to wind up evolving to the truth of how the universe really works or else this cataclysm happens and it wipes you out. The reason why God, the operating system, interfered with mankind is because he knew that every time this clock cycle happens, this is what it looks like in the creation at the atomic level or in the planetary and the star level, this pulse of energy happens and it's detrimental to all forms of life. That's why the operating system interfered. So we have free will, kind of, except on things that are important to him to fulfill his goal or his objective, you know, the programming that he has. I hope you've learned something and become more philosophical in your life. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I'm going to list this, this video also among the uh, series four so because it really answers that question in part five of series four.